Lord, how is everybody doing tonight? Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. I pray that you find something tonight that's going to really help you out tonight. My name is Pastor Cable Brown. I am the assistant pastor here at Charlotte Baptist Church, where Reverend Dr. James A. Thomas is the senior pastor. We're so grateful to have you with us tonight. If you hear anything tonight that's going to really help you, I suggest you hit the like button. I suggest that you let people know we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, just wherever you find us on social media, I suggest you go ahead and tell your friends and family. Because I believe tonight and the next three weeks, we're going to be together for three more for three weeks. So let's get comfortable together. Amen. We're going to be together for three weeks. And I'm going to talk to you about something I believe could really help you to help change your life, to help your life to become better more full. You see, Jesus said he come to give us life and that more abundant. But the question is how do we reach that abundant life? Amen. Understanding this, that we are in war, as you well know. If you wake up, you read the news, you hear the news, you see we are, we are at an all-time high when it comes to hate, when it comes to uh, division, when it comes to uh, gun violence, when it comes to mental, emotional issues, we are at an all-time high. So I want to talk to you today, I want to talk, start this conversation about fighting against the triple threat, fighting against the triple threat of depression, anger, and fear. The triple threat of depression, anger, and fear. I believe that these three things are the things that are holding many of us back. Matter of fact, just one of these issues, depression all by itself, can not only destroy a relationship, destroy a family, it can it can squash dreams, it can distort vision, it can it can hurt you on your job, it can hurt you mentally and emotionally, and watch this physically. Any one of these apart can eventually, if left unchecked, can literally put you in the grave. I mean that. You see, because there's times when our biology, our flesh, our the, 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 the pain that we go into through our bodies. Uh, when you have to deal with a cancer situation, you have to deal with some kind of situation that causes you to have restless nights and, and, and peaceless days. Uh, these things can not only affect your body, but can affect your mind. Hear what I'm saying? And vice versa, what can affect your mind can affect your body. So let uncheck any one of these three alone can do some severe damage. But I'm here to let you know that these three things gang up on you. These three things have a way of working together to pull you apart. And I want to I try to dissect each one of these. Now, I want to make a this disclaimer before we, go, before we go forward. The first one I want to talk about tonight is depression. Amen? And I want to let you know, I'm not a, a, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, I'm not a doctor. Um, so I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you have some kind of clinical issue, because some kind of depression can be clinical. It can be some kind of uh, 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 situation going on in your, in your brain that causes you to have uh, emotional uh, uh, trauma and detachment from reality, and you need medicine. Now I know anytime you talk about mental, uh, emotional issues or mental disease, anything like that, that many people take that as this, you know, something's wrong with you. No. Matter of fact, as quiet as it's kept, many of us are dealing with some kind of mental issue right now, some kind of emotional issue right now, that's keeping us from being able to fully express who we are and fully enjoy the life God has given us. So if you have been diagnosed with some kind of mental disorder, don't feel like you have to hide it. Go take your medicine. Do what you got to do to get yourself better. Amen? This is between you, your doctor, and God. Forget about what everybody else think. And here at this church, we believe in prayer and pills. Amen? You got to do what you have to do to make yourself feel better. To make yourself be, be able to be a part of the life God has given you. Be part of the society that you live in. Amen? But... There is a spiritual aspect to which I want to address. The spiritual aspect of depression I would like to try to help you with. Amen? Uh, before we go any further, I want to pray, and then we're going to go on and see what, what God has to say. Amen? All right. 
Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to come before you tonight. We ask that you speak to our hearts and our minds. And Lord, may those who are listening, Lord, may they get something out of this lesson that's going to help them to be able to overcome this, this spirit of depression, this aggressive uh, uh, spirit that wants to hurt them and harm them. And Lord, we pray that you also help them when they come down to their anger and fear. Lord, you help us all to be able to overcome these things so we can live the life, the full life that you have promised us, Lord. We thank you and praise you because you said in your word, you come to bring us freedom. And for freedom, Christ has come to set us free. So, Lord, we want to walk in the full, the fullness of that freedom. Lord, we give you all the glory and the praise. I humble myself before you and your people who use this vessel to your word. I thank you and I praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, this is a little bit different teaching from the pulpit. And my wife is in the room. And y'all pray for me because she likes to act up from time to time. Amen. But uh, I'm glad that she's here, amen? But uh, so I want, I want to talk to you today, if I can, uh, just to help you to understand that you can have victory over depression, anger, and fear. Let's talk, let's talk. First of all, let's talk about the, uh, the definition of depression. The dictionary defines depression as an emotional condition, either neurotic or psychotic, characterized by feelings of hopeless, hopelessness, inadequacy, gloominess, dejection, sadness, difficulty in thinking and concentration, and inactivity. Now watch this. Though it may seem, it may seem as though this is something that is primarily for those who are non-Christians, Christians and non-Christians suffer with depression. Don't let anybody fool you to believe it, that because we pray and we read our word and we come out to service on Sunday and maybe come out with Bible study on Wednesday and we have a praise and we always say, when someone asks us how we feel, we say, I'm blessed and highly favored. There are times when we may be looking like we paste the smile on our faces and say everything is okay, but internally we're falling apart. Amen. Some of us have learned to be the great pretenders. We know how to put on a great act as if everything is okay. But when we're behind closed doors, there's a different story going on. And what we want to do is get beyond the face, get beyond the pasted smiles, get beyond the fake, the fakeness, and reach into where we really are and say, Lord, help me, help me get myself together. Amen, somebody. Amen. I, I, I need God to help me to get myself together. One of the results of depression, or what depression looks like, or I said a few of them, but depressed people have a negative self-image. Amen, somebody. They have a negative self-image, often accompanied by feelings of guilt and shame and self-criticism. Always talking negative about not just everything, but including themselves. They don't feel like they ever mount up to anything. They're always trying to prove something. They're always trying to make themselves feel like they're somebody when all you have to do is remember, if you're a child of God, you are somebody. doesn't matter what somebody else thinks. doesn't matter how someone else feels. It doesn't matter what someone else said about you. You have to tell yourself, because I am, I am a chosen generation, I'm a chosen generation. I'm a part of a community of people. I'm a part of a royal priesthood. God said I am somebody. Therefore, I can walk as though I am somebody because in God's eyes, I am. The problem is, is, what is your self-talk like? How are you talking to yourself? If you're talking to yourself, the Bible says, life and death is in the power of the tongue. So if you're talking death to yourself, there's no wonder why you don't want to get up in the morning. It's no wonder why you don't want to raise your hand. It's no wonder why you feel listless and feel loveless and feel, and feel isolated and feel like you're on an island or by yourself. It's because you've been telling yourself that you can't make it. Telling yourself you can't do it. Telling yourself you're not worth it. Well, I, I suggest you change the way you talk to yourself. That's one of the first things you have to overcome when it comes to depression. How do you talk to yourself? David told his soul one time he had a conversation with himself. He said, soul, he said, so why I got cast down within me? I'm jumping ahead of myself, but we're going to be all right. Uh, he said, so why is that cast down in, within me? I will yet praise God. Amen. There's a time you have to tell yourself to praise God, regardless of how you feel, because a part of your overcoming depression is the prayer, is your praise that God is giving you. He said in Isaiah, he said, I give you the, the spirit of praise, for the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness. A depression is a heavy spirit. It's heavy to carry. 
That's why you feel the shoulders are strong. That's why your head is down. That's why you don't feel like smiling. Because you're depressed. And sometimes you don't even know you're depressed until you take a good and hard look at yourself. Amen? And ask God, why am I like this? What's going on? Why do I don't feel anything when I come to church? Why do I don't feel anything when I, when I should be in a position where I feel I'm around my grandkids, I'm around people I love, but I still don't feel like I'm a part of anything? Could it be that you're depressed? Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me look, look. Sometimes, sometimes the reason why we are walking around with this heaviness is because we have unconfessed sin in our life. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. We have unconfessed sin in our lives. If sin is at the heart of the problem, it should never be minimized. Amen? It should never be small as if it doesn't mean nothing. Neither should support be given to the idea that other things and other people are responsible for the behavior problems that are exhibited by the person in question. In other words, if you're experiencing heaviness, if you're experiencing depression, if you're feeling like you feel listless and you don't want to do much of anything, nothing brings you real joy. It may be because you have unconfessed sin in your life. And if you do, you don't need anybody patting me on the back and saying, baby, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Just pray about it. Just go on church and read your Bible and everything's going to be okay. No, if you have not confessed it, watch this. You are not wrestling against a, 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 a demon. You're not wrestling against the devil. You're not wrestling against your mom or your daddy. You are wrestling against God. And if you're wrestling God, you cannot win that fight. Yeah, how do I know? There's a scripture here. This is Bible study. We're going to start looking at some scriptures. There's a scripture in uh, Psalms 32. Psalms 32, verses 1 to 5. Psalms 32, verses 1 to 5. Uh, and it speaks of David after he had sinned uh, with Bathsheba. You ever remember the story? David had, when he was supposed to go out with the kings, when the kings went to war, over in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11, when the kings went to war, David sat home. And as he was sitting home, he saw this woman by the name of Bathsheba, who had, who has, uh, was bathing herself, and he became enticed by her. He was tempted by her, by the very look and appearance that she had drew him towards her. So what he did was, even though he knew she was married to one of the men named Uriah, who was a part of his warrior king, his warrior uh, uh, band of men who went out to fight on his behalf, he decided to tell the, tell the, the servants, go get her for me. Brought her to his house, he slept with her, and before you knew it, she was impregnated by the king. This was a violation. <laughs> this was a violation. This is a violation of God's word, a violation of any friendship, a violation of the king's authority. He overstepped his boundaries. Amen? He overstepped his boundaries. One of the words he used in this text we're going to look at, he used transgressions. That means to overstep, to rebel. Amen? So David rebelled, knowing what God expected, he slept with her anyway. And then when time came and he found she was pregnant, what he did was, instead of saying, I did this and making things right, he decided to send Uriah to his house to try to get him to sleep with his wife so that he could say the baby was his. This is some crazy stuff. You don't need to make this up. Amen? This is in the Bible. All right, so he, he sent his, his sent Uriah to sleep with his wife, but Uriah, because of his integrity, because of other men out the war, he said, I can't go ahead and sleep in my own bed, be with my wife, while the rest of the men out here fighting the war. He said, no. So he decided to stay away from his wife, and since David could not get him drunk enough, could not persuade him to go home, he decided to send him into the heat of the battle. Where he ended up and other men along with him died because David would not confess his sin. Mm. How many people are being affected by our sin because we won't confess it? How many people are being affected by what we do because we won't get it right? That's a, that's a story, that's a, that's a statement or, or, or something for another time. Amen? But if you look at the text, you look at the text, I'm giving you a biblical, biblical example of depression. When it's, when it's caused by unconfessed sin. 
First off, David said, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and whose spirit is no deceit. I need to stop right there for a moment, just with verses 1 and 2. When he used the words, notice what words he's using. Blessed is the one whose transgressions, whose rebellion, whose rebellion, overstepping the boundaries, overstepping what you knew to be true, what you knew to be wrong. You said he overstepped it anyhow. He did it anyway. And he said whose sins, whose offense, whose crime. It's like when we, when we disobey God, overstep his boundaries, he says, you're committing a crime. Uh, yeah. And then he used another word, uh, in the word iniquity, and it says, whose sin, whose iniquity is covered, whose, watch this, depravity, whose guilt that's, that requires punishment. God said, because you overstepped the boundaries, committed a crime, you should be punished. Mm. Wow. David, the Bible who says that he's a man after God's own heart, a man who did everything God told him to do, the one who God delighted in, the one who was the apple of his eye, he said, this is my man David who had done such grievous sin that he ought to be punished for it. And David recognized this. David understood this. If I can give you something before I really mess up. One thing, if you're going to overcome depression, and if it's a sin problem, then what you need to do is be real with your sin. I know we don't like to talk about that little word, S-I-N. We, we, we want to try to get that expunged out of our vocabulary. We want to make sure we don't talk about it no more. Because sin causes me to take a good look at me. It's not about what somebody has said about you, what somebody has did to you. It's about what you are doing. How have you transgressed? How have you overcome, over, over, over with the boundary? How have you broke God's rule and regulation? How have you committed the offense? How have you committed the crime? God says, how have you? Admit that you did it. The first thing to overcome the person when it comes to sin, you got to be real about your sin. You have to be real about it. you got to say what it is. Don't play with it. Don't minimize it because it's dangerous. I told you, depression just by itself can put you in the morgue because it can cause hypertension. It can cause all. It cause heart problems, mind problems, physical ailments. Amen. Stress and, and cause you to have anxiety all because you're walking around depressed. And if it's sin, you can get rid of that. You don't need a pill for that. This is not a biological problem. This is not an emotional problem. This is a theological problem. How do I know because it says on the text? Look what it says in verse 3. When I kept silent, mm, verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, listen to this, for day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sat as the heat of the summer. Look what David is saying. David is saying, I didn't have a biological problem. There wasn't something wrong with me physically. Until something was wrong with me spiritually, my physical body became, became uh, 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 impaired because of my spiritual walk. I had a theological problem. It was God who had his hand on me, is what David was saying. He had his hand heavy on me. You thought it was the devil he tried to shake him off. You thought it was the devil trying to praise him off. You thought it was the devil trying to praise him off. But God says, no, that's my hand because you won't confess. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Say, I ain't turned to this channel for this. Don't turn yet now, because God got something for you. Amen. Don't, 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 don't dismiss what being said. Because many of us are living beneath our spiritual privileges simply because we won't confess our sin. I try to carry sin for a while. I try to keep it under cover. I try to keep it under cover darkness. But God was so heavy on me, it felt like a gorilla was standing on my chest. It felt like I couldn't breathe. And God says, the only reason why it's like that is because you won't tell me, you won't confess. I know what you did, you know what you did, and what it, when you know what it's doing to you. Then stop allowing it do it, to do it to you, stop allowing the devil to take advantage of it, and confess it, and get it off you. Get it off you. Amen. David had a problem with God. He said, day and night your hand was heavy on me. He said, my strength was sad. That sounds like depression to me. His strength was gone. His vitality was gone. Didn't want to get up. Didn't want to do his job. Didn't want to be the king. Didn't just want to just chill. Just leave me here. Let me just stay here. 
I don't really feel like doing nothing. And, and, and in some cases, I don't even know why I don't feel like doing nothing. But David had an inkling as to why he was like that. Look what else happened here. Look what happened in verse 5. Then I acknowledged, <laughs> I acknowledged my sin. I took note of it. I took, I took ownership of it. My sin to you. I acknowledged my sin to you. I confessed it. I said it. I spoke up. I didn't keep it hidden. I decided to expose it. And I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression. I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody was, and somebody was saying, thank you, Jesus. And, and forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave me for what I've done. You forgave me of the crime that I committed. You release me, you pardon me of the crime I committed. How, why? All I had to do is admit, acknowledge that I did something and not try to shut myself from it, shy away from it. I, I did it and I said it, I confessed it, and I prayed for the Lord and I left it here. Notice it didn't say David went to Jonathan, that David went to this person, David went to that person. David didn't have to go to all these people and say, I'm sorry. He just said, Lord, I did this before you. I sinned before you. Therefore, I'm bringing this before you. And God says, okay, cool, David. Find him. In one text, it, it was said, it was suggested David carried this thing for a year. Imagine a whole year walking around depressed, physically messed up because he wouldn't confess his sin. Notice in another, another uh, a portion of this is found in uh, Psalm 51. David's confession and plea for forgiveness. Psalm 51, David's confession and plea for forgiveness. Uh, it says here that if you look at the superscription uh, before the, the first verse, it says, from, for the director of music. David composed this song and said, here, I give this to you, the director of music, a song of David, when the, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with the death of Bathsheba. You already talked about that. But David wrote a song about this. David memorialized his sin and his confession through song unto, to God. So that it was left as something for us later on down the road to be able to take a hold of, read and say, okay, this is what I need. This is why I'm depressed. This is what I'm going through. And he said this, have mercy on me, O God. Hmm. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, brought out my transgressions. Notice what David did. David was leaning on the mercy and the unfailing love and compassion of God. He wasn't leaning on his ingenuity. He was not leaning on his, his leadership ability. He was leaning on the compassion, the love, and the mercy of God. He knew that God was merciful. He knew that God was love and compassion. He leaned into God rather than leaning away from God. Depression, anxiety, fear, and all these other things we want to discuss have you leaning away from God. David leaned in. Somebody say he leaned in. He leaned into God. Why? Because he knew the only way he can get past what he's going through is to lean in and, and into the love, compassion, and God's unfailing love and God's uh, mercy because that's the only way he's going to get through this. And then he says in verse 2, Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He knew he, if he was going to be purged of these things, he needed God to clean them up. You can speak it, you can pray about it, but you need God to clean you up. For I know, somebody say, I know. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. David walked around for a year knowing that he was wrong, but did nothing about it until Nathan came and said, David, you're the man, you need to get this thing straight. And then he goes on to say in verse 4, Against you, you only have our sin and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. In other words, God, whatever you do to me, I had it coming. I had it coming. But I'm leaning into your compassion. I'm leaning into your mercy. I'm leaning into your unfailing love. I'm praying that because of your character, who you are and how you always treated me in the past, that you're going to help me in spite of what I deserved. Amen, somebody. Thank God that you don't get what you deserve. I'm thankful I don't get what I deserve. I don't have a record standing here with this mic in my hand behind this sacred desk and talking about overcoming anything. Because I know me. I know where I've been. I know the things that I think, but God has been merciful. 
So let me, let me, let me close this portion up. When the feeling of depression is due to sin, we need to follow the biblical example David laid out in the two Psalms. First, I said already, acknowledge, take knowledge of the sin. Now, make sure you acknowledge, take ownership of it. Don't shun from it, don't hide away from it. Take ownership of it. Two, remove all pretenses of innocence. Don't act like you didn't do nothing. Amen. You know, when my kids were growing up, something was broken in the house because they had more than one in the house. Who did this? It wasn't me. They pointed at each other. So guess what? Everybody got in trouble. Same thing when we was growing up. If one of us didn't step up and say it, everybody was in trouble. Amen? Take ownership of what you did. Take ownership of the fact that you done something. Remove all pretense of innocence. Take note of what you are going through physically. David was drained of his vitality. If you're going through something, you don't, we went to the doctor, and it's not, it's nothing wrong with you. You don't sit here and you try to pray and you try to do those other things. Everything that you've done has so far not worked. Maybe it's because it's a sin you have not acknowledged. A sin you not have confessed. So take note of your physical well-being because a lot of times your spirit will affect your spirit, your physical. Your biology will be affected by your, 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 your spirit. Amen? Uh, confess the sin fully. Don't just come up and say that. Well, Lord, uh, um, you, you know I, 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 I'm sorry because I, um, um, I did something. I did something. No, you say what you did. Amen. You can't fool God anyway. He knows to so just be straight up honest and fully confess and ask God to forgive you. Ask God to forgive you, and He will because He's compassionate. He's merciful. He's kind. He's waiting to forgive you. You remember the the, uh, the boy who took all his uh, all that, that his father has given him. He took it and he ran off with it, right? The prodigal son. Well, I'm going to go here, but I need you to just. I know you heard the story before, but it fits the context right now. The prodigal son asked his father before his father died to give him all that he was going to get after the father died. He wanted his stuff back. Now, isn't it something that to even say, give me my stuff when it wasn't really his? But what is more what is more incredible about the story is that the father gave it to him. And then he went away and spent all his stuff upon right to living. He did, he went to every, every, every juke joint, as you said back in the past, he went to every strip club, he was doing everything he could, okay? He was out there with loud, wild women and doing living it up until he became broke. And then nobody in that town where he was wanted to give him anything. They act like he didn't exist. He got to the point where a Jewish boy who's supposed to be holy and kosher, he was going to eat his feeding pigs and he was about to eat what the pigs were eating. That's deep right there because a person who was raised up with a kosher living was about to eat something that was unkosher and, and was not and, and was, was supposed to touch. But he's so hungry, he's about to eat what is given to the pigs. And the Bible says when he came to himself, and in other words, all of a sudden his mind reminded him, oh wait a minute, my dad is feeding the servants better than I'm about to eat. Let me go back to my father's house, confess my sin, and tell him. I'm a matter of fact, he went practicing. I'm going to tell him this. I'm going to say, I fall, I'm sorry. I, 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 I sinned against you, and, and, and I'm, I'm sorry I did these things. And, and as he's practicing, as he's talking, and he's walking, taking, going back home, the Bible says the father's seen him from afar off. What well, it suggests in the text is that the father's looking for him every single day. Do you understand what God is doing while you're sitting here trying to hold on to your depression, hold on to your sin, hold on and, and the sin is wrecking you? He's looking for you to come back every day. Will it be today? Will it come on today? I hope they do. I want them, I want to put my arms around. I want to show them my love, but they keep going in the wrong direction and think they can handle it. Let go of this mess. Let it go. Amen. So instead, so, so when the son got there, instead of being able to even tell the father, the father interrupted him, grabbed him, kissed him, and understand, this kid has got a big style. This kid had not washed. He had not, he had not touched a bar of soap in who knows how long. But when the father seen him, hair matted, dirt all over him, feet dirty, clothes dirty, property torn, tattered, and the father grabbed him, didn't care what he smelled like, didn't care what he looked like, and the Bible says he kissed him all over. He was just glad that his son, whom he thought was 
was big as a lot and doing well. He said, take these old dirty clothes off him, put a ring on his finger, put a robe on his, on his back. Man, put, restore him, he's still my son. And that's what God is telling somebody today, that you're still a son, a daughter of God. You may be walking around filled with all this depression and anxiety because of the sin that you've done, but God said, I'm waiting for you to come back so I can restore you. I'm going to put you right back in a position where you work and even higher and better because you have, you have learned some things by going out, out on your own and now you realize I can't stray too far away from my daddy. I learned over so far because it's crazy out there. I got hurt out there. I got messed up out there. I was filled with depression, anxiety, and worry out there. But in the presence of my father, there's fullness of joy and peace. So, when he went back home, he was restored. God is saying, that's what I want to do with you. I want to, I want to, I want to relieve your burden of that depression. I want to do it. But when you come back home, you're sitting at home and you're watching us on TV when you should be in the house. You have gifts you're supposed to use. Oh, we just turn the corner on somebody. You should be in the house. Instead of watching Bible study, you should be in Bible study. We have prayer on 6 o'clock now. Come on out and get some prayer. Put some prayer on this thing. Amen. Instead of sitting back and hoping that things are going to change, you've got to become proactive in your victory over one of the triple threats, which is depression. Amen. Let me move on. I'm not even sure how much time I got. All right. Uh, I know I ain't going until I'm done because I could be here for a little while. Amen. So let's look at this. Depression is somewhat of a charged issue among Christians. Why? Because some things is just flatly sin, some things is because of something you did. But sometimes, as I said earlier, it could be a chemical imbalance in your brain and you need some help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Amen? Don't be afraid to ask for help. And let me let me say this before I move on, because I think I said it in, in one of these steps to which you have to use if it is a sin. Uh, Finally, let the sin go. You said you're sorry. You asked for forgiveness. God gave you forgiveness. Then let it go. Don't carry it again. The Bible says, cast all your care upon me, for I care for you. Don't you pick it back up. The enemy wants you to believe that because you, oh, you, you said some words. You made some confessions. Oh, that's nice. That's pretty. But you really can't believe that God will forgive you for that. I'm here to let you know that the devil is a liar. The Lord went to go down his hill for the express purpose of forgiving us of our sins. I didn't say sin, I said sins. Past, present, and future sins. He who knew no sin became the righteous, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He became sin for us. So if you fall into some kind of gross sin, don't you sit there and let the devil keep beating you up and cause you to walk around depressed all the time. Lift up your head is what the Bible tells us. Psalms 24. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the king of glory shall come in. David had a nerve to ask, who is this king of glory? He's the Lord strong and mighty, Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted and the king of glory shall come in. God will show up. He will be in your house. He will invade your mind. He will invade your spirit. If you decide to lift up your head and say, Lord, I'm done. I'm letting this go. I'm not going to let it bother me no more. Speak to yourself and tell yourself, I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to let it bother me. I'm not going to get crazy. I'm going to let it go. So I have other biblical examples, like when, I'm not going to get into all of them, but Elijah, Elijah, when he had fought against the prophets of Baal, he had slayed all the prophets of Baal, which I had time to get into the whole story. But he had slayed, the whole, just read uh, 1 Kings 18 and 19, make that your homework, 1 Kings 18 and 19. Uh, when he slayed the prophets of Baal, the Bible says that after he had slayed the prophets of Baal, the wife of Ahab, Jezebel, hearing this, said, told him, said now the threat to him, said, see if you're not going to be like one of the prophets by tomorrow. In other words, I'm going to kill you. 
And when he heard that, after his great victory, after seeing God move by fire, he got up and ran because of fear. We talked more about that at last class. But he, when he ran, he found, the Bible says he found himself under a juniper tree, exhausted, filled with depression, filled with anxiety, and here he is laying there. And what God did was something that I don't think many of us realize. God did not rebuke him. God did this. He fed him. He had a raven bring him food. He gave him a cruise of water. There was a cake sitting there that was, that was already baked. He gave him something to eat, something to drink, and let him rest. Y'all you know, hear this? Another thing that's going to help you with depression is you just say, you know what? I'm going to take it down for a while. I'm going to just rest. I'm going to give you something to eat. I'm going to give you something to drink. You replenish your strength through eating and drinking. And then getting some rest, you, you replenish your vitality. You're able to handle things when you're rested. But many of us think we have to keep moving, especially as men. We have to keep moving. I'm not talking about what I'm going through. Just keep working. But you don't, well, well, watch this. There's a whole lot of people who try to work through their problem without really facing their problem. They end up in the morgue. You ever hear what I'm saying? He did not rebuke him. He let him rest. Somebody say rest. God wants you to get some rest. Lay down. Turn the TV off. Find yourself a good book and get in the corner somewhere. Turn on some music that make you feel good. And just rest. Tell your, tell your wife, tell your husband, tell your kid. Let this good thing give me some me time. Take time off from work if you got it. Just, just chill. Get some rest. That will go a long way to help you overcome depression. Amen, somebody. I'm going to get right to some of the things that's going to help you to overcome this thing because I think I only have a few more minutes. Um, the solutions, the solutions to depression. You may feel you may suffer from the, from, mm, okay, we won't stop here. You may suffer from depression in, in reaction to adverse situations, defeats, and setbacks, such as death in the family, a rebellious child, or a loss of a job, and unexpected problem, unexpected problems can throw any one of us into a state of depression. But you do not have to let depression have its way. Amen. You do not have to allow the enemy to have victory over you. So one thing I want you to hear, you need to write this down. One thing you need to do if you're going to overcome depression, here's some of the things that's going to help you, solutions to, to uh, uh, depression. Pray. Thank you. The first thing you have to do is learn to pray. Psalms 34, 17 and 18 says, When the righteous cry out for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the broken heart, heart and saved the crushed in spirit. What we have to learn how to do is pray. Cry out to God. That's the first thing. Prayer should be the foundation of your deliverance. I'm praying. I'm talking. I'm exposing myself to God. It's not just giving words, but I'm exposing everything I am to who my God, my God, so He can see me as I am. Reveal to me who I am, so I'll be able to go ahead and properly uh, uh, address Him, and, and He can properly give me what I need. I have to ask Him if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me to the right path. Lead me to a way of everlasting. Amen. So I have to learn how to pray. First thing. Second thing is, find your identity in Christ. Remember who you are. If you're born again, you are a child, you are a born again child of God. Look what it says in 1 John, well, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, John 1 12. But to all who have, who he did receive, who did receive him, who believed in him, in his name, he gave the right to the authority to become children of God. You are a child of God. Doesn't matter how it feels, doesn't matter what it looks like. If you made a true heartfelt confession, God said you belong with me, you're my child. So well, instead of identifying with your problem, identifying with depression, identifying with the world around you, tell yourself, I'm a child of God, and that's who you identify with. You identify with your father, identify with the God in heaven. Say, Lord, because I'm yours and you're mine, I know I have the strength to overcome whatever it is I'm facing. Alright? And it says, next thing, stay in Christian community. Stay in Christian community. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to, to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in this habit of some, but encouraging one another. We need each other to 
said in, to encourage, to build up, to strengthen one another. When you stay home and you're not in the presence of other believers who are going through the same thing you're going through, where are you getting the strength from? We've got the strength, we got the strength from one another. Amen? Another, another thing is, something that we need, all need to do, every now and then, unplug. Unplug. Brandon Hill Perlman said this, unplug, unplug. He said, formal addiction is a problem. Amen. Studies have found that people who spend more time on their phone have higher risk for depression. You're always looking at what somebody's saying, what somebody's doing, who's doing this, who's doing this. He said this about me, who said that? Put up, plug. Turn off these devices sometimes and just spend some time in the presence of God. Just be still and know he's God. Be still, be quiet. And find our coming to rest. It is vain that you rise up early and go to bed late and to rest. Uh, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. Psalms 127 and 2. Get yourself some rest. And lastly, tell somebody. I'm done. Tell somebody. The Bible says confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Tell somebody you're going through something. Tell somebody you're depressed. Tell them. Find a good friend and say, listen, I need to talk to you, me and you, one-on-one. -on -one. That's a part of the Christian community. I know it's hard sometimes to find somebody you can trust. But pray and ask God to give you somebody because we all need somebody with some fresh on to help us through some tough times. Amen, somebody. Now I'm done. I just got by here for a little while. I don't know if I overstayed my welcome, but I hope you found something that's going to help you. We're, we're going to be together two more times after this. The next time we talk, we're going to talk about anger, something I'm very well acquainted with. Amen. Something I'm very well acquainted with. We're going to talk about how to get rid of second of the two, second of three triple threats, which is the next one is anger. So meet me next week about the same time. Amen. We're going to go through this together. God bless you. We love you. Remember us on Facebook. Remember we're in uh, service in both locations. Here in Port Arthur at 1030, I mean 1130 on Sunday morning and 930 in Vineland. And we hope to see you. We love you. God bless you. Amen.